Welcome to episode 38 of the Horsemanship Breakthroughs podcast, Understanding Horses with Gabby Nura. So I found out about Gabby through her book, Understanding is the Key. And I was really drawn to this book firstly because of the title. And then as I was reading it, I just thought, yes, this this woman is exactly in alignment with how I like to train my horses. Like I, I found myself highlighting a lot of sections and really enjoying the book. So I was super pleased that Gabby said yes to coming onto the podcast. Now, Gabby says she doesn't like to be put into a box or have the stamp of a method as such. She believes that good horsemanship, good horsemen and women usually share the same principles. Their techniques might be different, but principles remain the same. You will see Gabby playing on the ground, at liberty, riding dressage, jumping a cross-country course, riding endurance, riding bareback and riderless, and sometimes you might even see her in a western saddle. Gabby's goal for every horse, every session, is to find the connection to the horse and make him or her feel proud of his achievements. A happy, healthy horse that loves to do stuff with his human partner no matter what the discipline. Gabby loves to learn, educate herself, be open, and look at other aspects of horses. So over the years, she has gained a huge knowledge about extra areas of expertise, including natural hoof care, horse nutrition, phytotherapy, natural horse boarding, healthy biomechanics, and basic basic saddle fitting. And so you can see why I asked Gabby to come onto the podcast. I feel we share a lot of the same values when it comes to horses and she has such a broad knowledge base and experience. So I really enjoyed talking to her about her horsemanship journey and all things horsemanship. And I really found that she had a very calming and humble energy. So it was really easy to talk to her and there's a lot of golden nuggets, as she would say, um, in this podcast. And as always, if you love this episode, please take a screenshot and share on social media and or leave me a review on Apple Podcasts. Every single review and share on social media really counts and I love to get your feedback about the show. And also don't forget to sign up to my books and resource list. I've got a list of various resources that people recommend on the podcast um, that you can easily download and refer back to as well as my weekly horsemanship breakthrough emails where I share with you every Tuesday morning, I send you an email of a horsemanship breakthrough that I've personally had on my own journey in the hope that it will help you on your journey also. So you can sign up for those things for free at amaliadempsey.com. All right, without further ado, let's jump into the show and I really hope you enjoy this interview. Welcome to the Horsemanship Breakthroughs podcast, a source for riding and training insights with the goal of helping your horse be a light, happy, and willing partner. I'm your host, Amalia Dempsey, a mainstream equestrian rider who discovered natural horsemanship and equine learning theory, and now I help riders like you achieve connection and communication with your horse so you can have more fun and fulfillment whilst prioritizing the partnership. Get more learning resources, including my free connection and communication mini course at AmaliaDempsey.com. Click the follow button so you don't miss an episode. And if you're enjoying the podcast, please leave me a rating and review or screenshot this episode and share on social media. I hope you enjoy the show. Welcome Gabby Neura to the Horsemanship Breakthroughs podcast. Thank you so much for being here. I'm really looking forward to talking all things horsemanship today. So thank you and welcome again. Hi Amelia. I'm really happy to be here and have the chance to, well, have a chat with you. Excellent. Well, I always like to start with your horsemanship journey. So could you tell us a little bit about your horsemanship journey to date from when you got into horses and what has led to where you are today? All right. So I think my story is a bit unusual. I'm not born in a horsey family and I'm actually the only one in my family who has been caught by the horse fever and already with six years of age, I started to beg for a pony and I want to ride. I want to have a pony, even though no one in my family is in contact with horses. And I just kept kind of (laughs) nagging, I guess until my parents could finally afford lessons and I had my first riding lesson with 11 years only um and my parents well my mom always loved animals and we always had animals and with 12 years old I finally got my first pony so this was really an absolute highlight and I'm so happy that my parents supported me me through my horse journey 
even though they never had a lot of money. And I think they did a huge amount of sacrifices to support my dream because I think they realized my horse dream is not just a shortly passion or girly dream. It is something that really, well, it consumes the whole me. <laughs> I am, I live horses. It's really a passion of mine and I never wanted to do anything else. I always said, I'm going to become a horse breeder. <laughs> I'm not there yet, but uh, I want to live with horses and horses are my passion. I want to make that my job. So this is how it started. Amazing. Wow. I think yeah. we've had like a mixture of people who have been brought up in horsey families. And then I feel like yeah. there's a few of us around myself included, who didn't grow up in a horsey family, but we've just been born with that horsey bug. Yeah. And no matter what, we just want to be around horses. And um, I think everyone listening to this podcast uh, can relate to that. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So what what else happened on your journey in terms of what actually, I know you always sounds like you always wanted to work with horses, but um, yeah. did you train with anyone in particular? Did you compete? Can you give us a little bit more context in terms of um, around that sort of thing? Okay, so I have, um, as a teenager, tried to live in absence of horses for two years, and I got miserable, depressive, uh, up to the point that I said, okay, it does not work anymore, and I quit high school and changed over to actually doing a professional education for horse breeding management and education of young horses. Um, so that was a pivotal point. They really said, okay, I'm not going to go down the academic route. I'm going down the practical why really becoming a horse professional, studying it and really getting into the nitty gritty. And, but when, once I was done with this, I was 19. I was like, okay, I'm way too young, way too unexperienced to already start working as a professional. I have to uh, gain experience. Otherwise I cannot, you know, do a good job for people on the horses. So, um, and at that point, one of my teachers, the horse braiding and feeding teacher, he at that point, he knew Pirelli and Pirelli was very, very new back then in Austria. It was 2007, I think or six ish. Um, and he kind of taught us the very basics on the ground about fall handling, especially. And that's how I started to learn about natural horsemanship. And, um, Somehow I heard about the five star instruct in Switzerland, Bernie Sambal. And uh, just when I was done with my education, I saw a post on Facebook. He was looking for a working student. And I was like, wow, I'm going to take that opportunity. <laughs> and because at that moment I had my mare Matsira, I bought her as a three year old. That was four years prior to that. Um, and I wanted to do everything right with her, but uh, things had, well, not gone right because it was way not enough experience. And I actually had issues such as I couldn't catch her in the field and she gave me all the feedback in the world. Hey, I do not enjoy being with you. I do not enjoy our time. And this actually really broke my heart because I really tried to do my best for her and do things right. And when I saw that working student position at Bernie Sambal, I was like, okay, I'm going to jump really right in. I'm going to make a commitment. I'm using this time to do things right for Matsira. I'm going to really try my best, learn what I need to learn to win my horse's heart. So, and at that time, Mayana was just born. She was a few months old. So I waited until I could wean her off. And then I went uh, to Germany to work for Bernie Sambal and really dive into that horsemanship journey. So in saying that, Bernie Sambal is also my most influential mentor. He's uh, He really taught me so much about reading the horse uh, and also the importance of um, developing ourselves. It's not about fixing the horse. It's really about looking into ourselves and being self, well, very self-aware about uh, what we do with our horses. Mm. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I always say self-development and horsemanship are kind of the same thing, right? <laughs> yeah, and, and my, many people don't realize it first, but in the end, it is it goes hand in hand. Yeah, so that was really my big start into horsemanship. Prior to that, in my horse professional training, I had a very 
classical education. I'm an English writer. Um, I also have the traditional writing teacher diploma, so to speak. Um, so I'm not a Western writer, but uh, what I really do is, well, I want to give horses a broad foundation. I think then discipline doesn't matter. What matters is to really understand the horse, the horse's mind. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. that is, that's the title of your book, right? Exactly. That's why that is the title, because I think um, we horse owners and riders, what we first have to do is understand our horse. And the second part is understand ourselves. <laughs> we understand the nature of the horse, what horses need, how horses think. Um, and then once we understand that, then we can make the conclusions about how to train the horse. Mm, yes. Yeah. Yes. And on that note, I suppose understanding horses is, um, I guess, the foundation of your training approach. But could you kind of summarize how you approach your horses now or give a little bit more detail around that? What is your training philosophy with horses? Wow, that is a difficult one to answer because it don't follow clearly one method. Mm. As I said, well, my first uh, introduction with horsemanship was through Pirelli and I really studied the program very deeply for years but it's by far not my only influence uh, actually when I had my very first pony at 12 years of age my mom bought a few books because we were total beginners <laughs> not an ideal combination but one of well her very first book was one of Linda Tellington Jones ah. for example yeah so I did all those groundwork exercises with ponies and also did the T-touch and experimented there. So yeah, I'm also using elements from there. Then it was for a while really following Monty Roberts and the join up. I don't any longer, but you know, that was a very important step in my journey too, to, to learn about horse body language. Mm -hmm. um, I also really love Frédéric Pignon. Uh, maybe you know yes. him, the French uh, he is just amazing at Liberty. I just love to watch him, what is going on between him and the horse. It's just amazing yes i yes. think that is so magical to watch and um he for sure in even though i've never been to a course with him or anything like that just watching that relationship he has with his horses what the horses are free to express their ideas and their charisma it has given me huge inspiration uh for the work with my horses and I also use a lot of elements of um, still classical riding because I think horses need to be gymnasticized correctly. Mm -hmm. I love to follow, for example, Ingrid Klimke and all her cavaletti yes. work and how she works horse in a really good way. Mm -hmm. um, but I also work with a capson <laughs> <laughs> in the classical in-hand dressage way and teach more the shoulder in travers on the ground. So I'm very versatile. Uh, but maybe what is the one most important thing for me when working with horses is that I feel my horses enjoy the work we do together. Yes. And that at any moment I'm going to adapt what I do to what the horse communicates to me, what he or she needs. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that at yes. no moment I'm hesitant to change my approach and what I'm doing and thinking, oh, this is right for the horse and I'm not going to follow my ego of I want to teach my horse now a shoulder ring or whatever <laughs> mm, yeah I think this is the overarching most important factor is to always preserve the relationship the dignity of the horse and the horse enjoys to work with me as well yes I love that and I love that you have such a broad foundation in terms of different areas that you've um, used as kind of like knowledge building, but also uh, influence and inspiration and brought it all yeah. together to make it your own with that layer of, you know, prioritizing the partnership and the relationship with the horse. That's yeah. amazing. Really nice. Yeah. To and could you tell us what has been your happiest horse memory? Happiest horse memory. <laughs> Uh, that is really hard. I have because I do have many, and I think most of them are tied with Mayana. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe the most, well, the happiest would be um, when she was born. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Can you describe that moment for us? 
Well, it was very strange. I have to start to cry. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering what the silence uh, was. <laughs> um, I probably had, well, a very special connection with the mom Matira. Mm-hmm. Oh, you're going to make me uh, cry, Gabby. <laughs> I have that moment also in my book, you know, in the introduction. And yeah. when I was reading it for the audiobook, I think I had to read it 10 times because each time I started crying. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. So I was, um, of course, anticipating the birth and I had my uh, Matira, the mom, always in the night in the stable. I would go check on her twice every night to see, you know. And in that particular night, I dreamt of her. And then I woke up and my room was just adjacent to the stables and I could hear her. So I woke up and heard a noise and was like, oh, that is it. Mm -hmm. So she kind of sent me a dream. Wow. Then I woke up in the right moment. I went out in my pajamas (laughs) (laughs) and the front feet were just out. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that was really, uh, yeah. And then, well, of course, we stayed there the whole time really make sure that Mayana had her first drink and had her first poop. And, you know, already then, once she got up, her first thing was not to look for the milk. Her first thing was to jump around her mom. Aww. And then to go and explore me. (laughs) Oh, that's so adorable. Yeah, and, and so from the beginning, she's been such a special character and so full of sparkling joy and Mm. um yeah she's just she grew up behind my house and I at that time I worked half time for a children's hospice who was working with horses and each time I came home uh from work at lunchtime I parked my car and slammed the door and she would whinny and call and come running to the gate that's so adorable yeah that was so it, it is, yeah, it is very special, the relationship with me and Mayana, and by now she's 15 years old. And another special thing about her is when she was born, I really promised to myself I would not let happen what happened to the relationship between me and Mayana, what happened to the relation between me and Matira. Because with Matira, well, as I told you, I, um, I kind of, I screwed it up in the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because I wanted it, I wanted it to work too badly. Yes. I got her when I was 17. She was three. Mm-hmm. And I really wanted to do everything right. Um, but I was also unaware, quite egoistic, and I wanted to show off show off in a way. Mm. And so I got quite task-oriented or results-oriented. And even though I said, I want to do everything right, well, unknowingly I pushed her often way too far and and been way too demanding and and judgmental on her and well she gave me the feedback she got quite distant to me and defensive and years back you know that mirrors attitude Mm. (laughs) yeah (laughs) quote unquote (laughs) yeah exactly and then when Mayana was born it was really made the promise I'm gonna not let that happen to her this is such a special little horse and this is yeah yeah and I think I'm quite proud to be able to say um I think I managed (laughs) (laughs) ah that's good I I think that um I mean it sounds like that was a breakthrough in itself you and it's a breakthrough I've also had on my horsemanship journey where the kind of the more you want something and the more you kind of push for it and make it like all or nothing Mm -hmm. the more you kind of push that away because the horse can feel that um Mm. that uh, desperateness in a way and also that pressure that you're not only putting on yourself but also your horse um yes maybe absolutely yeah and then the moment you kind of go with the flow let it go and really listen to your horse and base your training Mm. and journey around that instead of the outcome the more things tend to flow and as a result you kind of get those outcomes anyway (laughs) Yes, but it is the hardest thing to do in the horsemanship journey because um, we all want to reach a goal or we have the dream we want to reach, you know, And but we only reach it once we let go of it. It's kind of a yeah. predicament in itself. <laughs> yeah, it's a paradox. 
Yeah, yeah. And this is also what I see, uh, especially when coaching uh, the 30-day course, the 30-day relationship fast track course. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest topic for the participants is to allow themselves to be on the journey they are with the horse without putting pressure on themselves, allowing other people to put pressure on themselves, yes. on them. Totally. To really allow themselves to be where they are and enjoy every moment of connection they have with the horse without wishing to be already 10 steps ahead mm. or thinking I should already be 10 steps ahead or I should know better. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. I feel like if you interchange the word horse with life, with the, with what you just said, that applies mm. to life as well. Right. Like we got to enjoy Absolutely journey and not wish that we were somewhere else like it's great to have those goals and to be able to strive for um, yeah. next level but we've really got to enjoy the process otherwise mm -hmm. yeah it's not going to be a fun ride otherwise <laughs> we're just going to make ourselves miserable True. wishing to be somewhere else or wishing to be further ahead or regretting the past or shooting all over ourselves mm. yeah, yeah. Very wise words there, Gabby, and I'm sure people listening, that might be a breakthrough for them in itself, but uh, in itself, but what could you tell us what has been your biggest horsemanship breakthrough to date? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> or was that it? <laughs> well, well, when Mayana was born, it was for sure a pivotal point. Mm -hmm. Because I kind of made a decision, okay, I'm going to forget everything that I learned before because obviously it didn't serve me. And I'm gonna, just going to make myself very vulnerable and be a blank slate to be really open to learn new stuff. Mm -hmm. But after that, I mean, horsemanship is a journey. It's a continuous journey of development. And I have changed point of view and ideas and ways of doing things so often you cannot imagine. <laughs> yes <laughs> with each horse. so with, with each horse I got in training when I lived in France for 14 years each horse taught me something each horse showed me a new depth of a specific uh, concept or principle um, and forced me to look deeper and, and maybe change a few things and get better about reading the horse so I can say actually each horse I got the chance to work with brought some break breakthroughs for me mm. yes yeah was there, was there one that has stood out or that really kind of transformed the way that you do things like I think we have these little breakthroughs all along but mm -hmm. was there anything that really kind of shook you or woke you up so to speak woke me up so well, Mayana, it's again Mayana. Yeah. <laughs> We've all got that one horse that taught us yeah, lots of <laughs> Yeah, because, you know, she has been a huge teacher for me. Um, she has really brought me to my limits so often uh, because of her. Um, she is has an untamable spirit, mm. kind of to say, and she is so full of joy and sparkling and expressive. And, um, you know, natural horsemanship, there's so strong the idea still. Um, you have to be your horse's boss. You have to be the alpha. The horse is mm -hmm. the follower. And in order to to get this, uh, that the horse accepts you as a leader, you have to be able to move your horse's feet in all directions, no matter what. Mm -hmm. um, I've been following that idea for quite a while, I have to say. Mm -hmm. Um but I think it was quite to my benefit uh, that in France I've been so isolated. I've been on my own, just really immersed in my horsemanship journey and spending all day with different horses and, and being free to experiment. Um, and, you know, every day I spend my time with Mayana and she had her really exuberant outbreaks. <laughs> yep. In the beginning, I was like, okay, she's testing my leadership. Okay, I have to get leadership over that. But the more I allowed myself to feel and to be in the moment with her, I was like, this does not feel as if she's challenging my leadership. 
Mm. It just doesn't feel that way. Mm. It can't be. And that was also I mean, in the time when I started to watch the videos of Pinion. Mm -hmm. And I saw how he was playing with his stallions. And sometimes the horse had an idea and was just following. Then he again had an idea. And the, and the horse was following. I was like, oh, okay. Maybe we can also just play together. Not just play only my game and insist on, on leadership, you know. Mm. And I remember I had quite a few late night liberty plays with Mayana in the arena there mm -hmm. right was you know I don't, I don't know it's somehow when it's dark and it's silent and nobody else is watching me I'm a very introvert person by nature mm -hmm. um, this is when I can really feel for the horse and there I had some really magical moments of, of feeling that connection with the horse mm -hmm. and really meeting the spirit that lives in the horse and being together. And that, uh, that thought of, it can't be that horses are testing our leadership. It gotten stronger and stronger. And yeah, Mayana has been a big part of that. And the more I kind of allowed Mayana to show me her ideas and to be her sparkling self, and the more we just played together and that just I made her do what I asked her to do the better things got yes. and start to spill over to the other horses I had in training. So I think maybe to, to come to the realization and that the, now it's a firm belief, horses don't test our leadership. They want us to be partners. They want to be partners. They want to connect. They want us to see them mm. like another being. Maybe this is the biggest breakthrough or that was the most important. Um, yeah. Moment, I, you know. I really, I love that, Gabby, everything that you just spoke about in terms of that transition that you went from like thinking about, I guess you could say dominance or being your horse's mm. boss to actually really almost being on the same level as your horse. But yeah. what came up when you were saying that is how do people balance having those like healthy boundaries that keep them safe whilst not being their horse's quote unquote boss? This is something that uh, a lot of yeah. people me about as well so I'm curious to hear your opinion on that <laughs> it is a big big struggle for so many people mm -hmm. and I think it has a lot to do with um knowing your personal boundaries and and feeling them owning them mm -hmm. and this is nothing to do if it's just towards your horse but it has all to do also with uh, how you feel them towards other people Mm -hmm. you know if you just uh try to apply rules to a horse like he's not allowed to graze mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah <laughs> he's not allowed to take over when i'm leading my horse <laughs> it's just a rule yeah boundaries however they come out of yourself mm. and in order that we can communicate boundaries consistently to the horse we have to feel them. What feels right to you? When do you start to feel uncomfortable or unsafe mm. when a horse with a horse's behavior? Mm. And then we have to learn and dare to communicate that to our horse. Hey, I'm feeling unsafe with your behavior. I don't like that. Mm. Yeah. And I think this is the point. A lot of people don't dare to tell the horse, I don't like that. Yes. Yes, and this has nothing to do with being my horse's boss. Mm -hmm. Just because I tell my horse, hey, I don't like that. Mm. Yeah, and I think it's especially this the kinds of people that um, are probably attracted to the way you work with horses, Gabby. They're really heart-centered horse lovers um, who yeah. really don't want to say no to their horses, right? But I think a part of it is really mm. understanding that this relationship, it, it's got to be two ways and it's got to be safe. So yeah. it's got to be two ways. It's got to be safe. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. just because I want to have a good relationship with my horse, it does not mean that I let the horse walk all over me because I I think I'm precious too. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. I don't want to be walked all over. So I'm going to tell the horse, please, I don't like it if you invade my space, if, if you push on me. Mm -hmm. And 
it has nothing to do uh, that I'm my horse's boss. Mm. I'm just communicating with my horse from being to being. Yes. Yeah, just the same as you yeah. might establish a boundary with a another human. Like you, you wouldn't, yeah. in, a, in a human relationship, you wouldn't allow someone to kind of walk all over you even if you loved that person, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly, I mean, not, right. Yeah, not in a healthy relationship anyway. <laughs> Yeah, in a healthy one. <laughs> exactly, and this is exactly the point. And I, I write, a, write a bit about that in my book in the chapter about leadership and um, what kind of a twisted view we have on mm. this, especially as women often I see that mm. because of the social conditioning we have. Yeah, um, I think a lot of social conditioning is just don't speak up, mm. keep quiet, so... Um, that you don't upset people and step on their toes mm. and of course if I mean if you're conditioned like that it spills over to the relation with our horse and this is I think the source of why people communicate to the horse way too late when mm. the horse actually already overstepped the boundary 10 minutes ago yeah yeah yeah, where, where yeah. they could have addressed that boundary, I guess, in a smaller way earlier. In, instead, it became a bigger issue later on. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, so it starts also, always small and then it escalates. And then people only realize and address it once it's already an escalation. Then they have a real problem at their hands. Mm, yes, exactly. And I think um, if, if people are listening, going, well, yeah, my horse shows these like larger kind of behaviors. Um, but they seem to come out of nowhere. Like I get, Gab, mm-hmm. I'm sure Gabby would agree with me in that. Try and find those smaller moments when your horse first shows you that, you know, they might be overstepping that boundary or worried about something. Cause that's really where you want to address it. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And that has a lot to do with um, being able to be in the present moment mm-hmm. and being very self-aware, aware also about what the horse communicates. And only if you manage to be in a present moment, can we see what the horse actually communicates in things? And then we are able to have that connection uh, and see those little signs when the horse tells us the first time, hey, I'm a bit worried about this, or uh, I'm actually thinking about going to grass there, and I don't miss the moment the horse ends up either getting really seriously worried and has a big spook or <laughs> drags me over the lawn to eat grass. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And um, speaking of these boundaries and kind of missing those, that, that smaller communication, um, what's something that you wish that every horse owner would do differently? Um, maybe not something about doing, mm-hmm. but it's more about being. Hmm. It's about what I talked in the beginning. Um, I think if horse lovers would allow themselves more to just be in the moment with the horse and allow themselves to enjoy those moments of connection they have with the horse, Mm -hmm. they would be much happier and they would have a much better connection with the horses. Mm. Yes, totally. Yeah. And then when they do start doing things, it's probably going to be a lot nicer because they've got that uh, kind of, I guess, uh, foundation of relaxation and that relationship, mm-hmm. which is built on exactly. those yeah. yeah. Because everything they do or ask from the horse, it comes from a moment of being present mm-hmm. and not wishing or hoping, oh, I hope this works or, oh, I'm afraid this doesn't work. Yeah. If I'm present, I'm just with my horse know what I mean? <laughs> I do know what you mean, yes. <laughs> um, and, <laughs> yeah. It's, maybe, it's the, maybe hardest you know it. the hardest thing. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> you go. Yeah, it is the hardest thing to allow ourselves to be in the present moment because working with horses, it has such a high level of awareness and handling so many things at the same time. Yes. Our own body language, our emotions, our energy, at the same time, reading the horse, managing the big 600 kilo animal, mm-hmm. um, they worry about doing things wrong and think about what strategy, what technique and, yeah, uh, you know, tool handling. 
all that. And it's that makes it all difficult to really be in a present moment with the horse. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's like um, you, sometimes if you get too much in your own head and you can't mm-hmm. kind of operate off feel, I mean, especially in those early stages when you are kind of fumbling around with ropes and sticks and flags and whatever equipment that you might be using or what position you're supposed to be oh, in, yeah. it's really hard <laughs> to be in that 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 state of awareness and being present. And I feel like there are different levels of awareness and being present as well. And the, the further you go in mm-hmm. your horsemanship journey, I think you realize those deep levels yeah there are of course there are levels and uh uh, what i always tell people what is a big subject in the third day relationship fast track course is what really helps people is to look out for golden nuggets Mm. and what do you mean with that golden nuggets are um nice moments you have with your horse moments where you feel uh the connection or you wear your horse um does what you ask or gives you an unexpected present or even if your horse accepts when you say no please don't do that even that can be a gold nugget yes and if i get people to shift their focus on finding the golden nuggets they start to find more and more they're going to be more and more happy with the horse because the human mind naturally we focus on (laughs) the black nuggets (laughs) what doesn't work (laughs) But yeah, didn't work, true. but I didn't do right. And it just makes us miserable. <laughs> because we know we always know what we could do better. Yeah, true. <laughs> yeah. That's what we're yeah. we're heavily biased in terms of looking for, aren't we? We 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 can list the things yeah. we go wrong so easily, but I like that you mentioned that shift in focus and focusing on those gold nuggets because the more you can identify them, the more you're aware of finding them. It's almost like, you know, when you it's- um, you might not see a certain car around the place, but then you you might buy a new car and suddenly you see that new car everywhere and you're yeah. like, has everyone just bought the same car as me? Or And it's just because... It you, just happens to me right now yeah. <laughs> with the car. Oh, you've got a new car. <laughs> yeah, because we moved, you know, in spring from France to Austria. Yeah. And there we also are. It's crazy. Yeah, it, it's really interesting. But yeah, it's the same it? thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so next question. What do you think makes a happy horse? What makes a happy horse? Well, I think first the foundational needs of the horse have to be met. So that means friends, freedom, Mm -hmm. forage, (laughs) the three Fs. Good. I think this is very important. Uh, If a horse lives in isolation or is locked up in a stable, doesn't have enough turnout or is fed only meals with high rations of concentrates and has long times where he has nothing to eat, well, we're going to have issues. This horse is going to be unhappy. And Mm -hmm. if then we try to fix the problems with training, it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. And it might sound like the most logical thing in the world, But I still see so many people who don't make sure that the horse's basic foundational needs are met in that way and they're trying to fix behavioral issues with a method. It doesn't work. Mm. So after we have fulfilled our horse's needs of having friends and enough turnout and uh, a diet that's adapted to the horse's physiological needs, then I think what makes a happy horse is a horse that feels seen and understood. Mm-hmm. Mm. It's almost like, um, yeah. I don't know if you've heard of the uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs for humans. I'm not sure if it's common knowledge, but it's um, basically mm-hmm. that there's different levels of needs for humans. And I feel like horses have the same. Mm-hmm. So with humans, you know, at the at the boat at the most fundamental level, we need shelter and food, right, and water. Yes, um, yeah. But then, as we <laughs> as we have our needs uh, fulfilled, we get closer and closer to you know um, feeling like we need to be uh, you know recognized. Uh, we need we want a career. We want um, a stable future, and ultimately, human mm-hmm. fulfillment, right? Um, but with horses, mm-hmm. I feel like I love that you said the three Fs first. And then once they've established that, then there's that next layer of being 
at like needing to be seen and heard, which I feel like, yeah, we're yeah. Horse who's not even getting their fundamental needs met. It's like, that's their primary focus, like really yeah. social interaction and 24 seven forage. But yeah, I love that you mentioned that next layer of the horse's needs. Yeah. Really nice. Yeah. And I think, you know, of course we can also say, do horses really need humans? Mm. They have friends. No, they don't. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have but, this. <laughs> but we brought them into captivity. Mm. We brought them into our lives. So we do have a responsibility towards them as their owner. Yeah. All right. We do have a responsibility towards them as an owner that they can live and operate in humans' world happily, that they understand it, that they know to deal with all the restrictions, that they know how to uh, behave with a ferry visit and a vet visit, that they know that it's not dangerous, that they can relax, that they find the trust. Mm. And I also really think that horses are going to be happier if they have daily interaction and mental stimulation, also physical training, mm -hmm. in a good way, with a human they trust and like, than if they're just pasture pets. Mm, yes. Yeah. And I, I feel yeah. like I've witnessed that with my own horses because I've got two that I play with a lot and then a third mm -hmm. who has some health issues and I don't um, work with him as much. But he comes over and he's like, yeah. pick me today, please pick me. <laughs> even though he has those three Fs satisfied. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> it's cute. It is cute. Um, but I, yeah. I tend to agree. I think they do really enjoy that stimulation. And um, I guess you could say it's enrichment in yes. their lives. Whereas in uh, the yes, wild. Yes, it is. It having, is. Yeah, perhaps having in the wild, if they were, um, having that large space, I guess, to roam freely would provide them with that yeah. enrichment and variability that they don't get when they're on the same, you know, 10 acres for, for their life absolutely yeah mm. absolutely now I know you spoke earlier about Bernie being one of your most influential mentors but I always ask my guests on the podcast if you could have dinner with any three horse people dead or alive who would it be and why and what would you like mm. to talk about with them um what would you like to talk with them about yes of course horses but <laughs> specifically any questions that you'd have for them I think I would like to have a mix of uh, Freddie Nee, the circus guy. Mm -hmm. You know him? Uh, no, sorry. I thought you said Frederick as in Frederick Pignon, but no, I don't think I've no, heard. No. Yeah, okay. Freddie Nee, he is a, uh, he's a very famous circus in Europe, in Switzerland. And he's just amazing for his uh, liberty performance with his horses. Okay, oh, it's just amazing. I mean, senior, I think he doesn't live anymore, but junior still uh, trains a lot and they're, they're just amazing. Mm -hmm. So he would be a very interesting guy in the mix. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then I would love to have Karen Rolf. Yes. Yep. She's a huge influence for me. I just love her philosophy. I started to follow her, uh, I think, 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. I just love her energy and her way with horses and it's like it's so refreshing and, and natural and nice mm, me um, too I'm a big fan of Karen and I was mm. fortunate enough to have her on the podcast also so that oh, was that's cool cute. yeah <laughs> yeah so that would give a very nice conversation already absolutely yeah and then yeah, why not throw Frédéric Pignon into the mix? Yeah, I reckon that <laughs> sounds like a pretty interesting dinner. <laughs> yeah, that would be very interesting, yeah, to know their view about uh, relationship on horses, positive horse training, how to bring out the best in a horse, how to uh, encourage a horse to sparkle and really show their true nature and not just act like a well-trained robot. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that would be amazing. Mm. 
Yeah. Okay. Awesome. And do you have any favorite horse books or resources? I know that we touched a little bit on this off air, but are there any that you've, that have influenced you over your horsemanship journey? Yeah, uh, definitely the book of Karen Rolf. Yes. Love that book. Yeah. Yeah. It's also a great resource for exercises. Mm -hmm. As along with training philosophy. Mm -hmm. Um, I really love the book from Frédéric Pignon. Yes. Uh, is it, oh, I forget the name off the top of my head. Is it Gallop to Freedom? It's Gallop to Freedom. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's more sharing of a philosophy and his way of living with his horses than it is a book about training horses. Yes. But I think this is also what I like about him. It doesn't follow a method. Mm. Yes. I know we've spoken about kind of being detached from those outcomes and goals, but is there something that you are striving for whilst, you know, still kind of remaining casual or detached from the outcome? You mean a tangible goal? Yeah. Yeah. Is there something that you're specifically working towards, say, with yeah. your own horses or perhaps... um the influence that you'd like to have on other people's horsemanship? Is there a, a kind of like a mission that you're on? A mission that I'm on? I guess the overall mission would be uh, to help other horse owners to find the connection and to understand the horses better. Mm. This is the mission for other people. For me as a, uh, a person who really wants to transmit what I know about horses and love about horses and for myself and my own horses. Um, because I was thinking about that quite a lot lately. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, the last years I've been way less active, actively actually training my horses and, and, and achieving stuff because I've been busy with so many other things. But lately I, th I thought to myself, I'm actually, I'm very, very happy right now with my horses and the relationship uh, I have. Mm -hmm. Because I think ultimately what I want is that I feel part of my horses, of, of my horses herd. Mm. Yeah. I think this, for me, this is the essence. I want to feel um, I am one of theirs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so beautiful. <laughs> and yeah, I would, you know, I love, for example, I love the sport of endurance, not kind of the crazy races and really high speed, that not. Mm -hmm. But like what you see on, on in the United States, a lot about endurance, mm -hmm. uh, really being with the horse in nature alone, uh, going through challenges together and experiencing that partnership of connection. This is, I really love that. Mm. And and of course, I dream of, for example, riding the Tavis Cup. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or in Europe, there's another race in Florac, mm -hmm. also 160 kilometer race, an amazing landscape in the Pyrenees. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, I have those kind of dreams, but uh, I'm not going to push towards them. I, I do have the horses that could go for mm -hmm. that my youngsters yes. <laughs> but I'm not yeah. gonna push towards that yes, you know no, that makes sense yeah because yeah the you know, connection and relationship is more important for me and if I for example I'm not in a place in my life right now that I can really focus on that to make that happen in a good mm -hmm. way I'm even not even gonna feel sorry about that right now I cannot pursue my goal yeah yeah well, that yeah. that's good I think it sounds like you've already achieved a lot of what your whole essence is around horses anyway in terms of just being a part of the herd really yeah. um nurturing that relationship and any goal that you achieve um is kind of a bonus I guess on top of that so really nice and I think our listeners can um be inspired by that and, and take the pressure off themselves to need to achieve mm. things this is sort of what we spoke about earlier and just enjoy that journey and prioritize that relationship and connection with their horse yeah exactly and so before we wrap up can you tell us what is we've spoken about a lot of different uh lovely messages but what is the one message you would like our listeners to know from today's interview mm, 
maybe the one message. Um, well, earlier I talked about maybe what was my biggest breakthrough was when I, when I really started to feel and discover horses are not challenging our leadership. Mm. They might have their own ideas, but they're not going to say, okay, I'm today I'm going to test my human. And they're not doing things to us. Yes. And uh, once I start to really embrace that and let go of that idea of dominance theory and being my horse's boss and my horse is testing me, mm -hmm. um, so much emotion just fell away in training horses. Mm. Yeah. I didn't need to feel personally attacked and criticized by my horse anymore. Mm. And I think if people can embrace that too and let go of that uh, idea of dominance theory and I have to be my horse's boss and my horse has to accept me as a leader, if only they manage to embrace that one point, they could find much more peace and connection with the horse. Mm. Yes, I agree. And throughout this interview, Gabby, everything you've said, I'm like, yes, yes, love what she's saying. Um, and that's sort of how I felt when I very first came across you through your book. And as I was reading it, I've got so many highlighted sections like, yes, yes, she's speaking my language. I love this. Yeah. And that's exactly how I felt throughout today's talk. So can you tell our listeners where they can mm -hmm. find out more about you and what you offer and your book, etc.? All right. So my book is available on Amazon and I think the easiest is to just put uh, the title into the search bar on Amazon. It's called Understanding is the Key. Um, I'm unsure if now a physical copy can be shipped to Australia, otherwise worldwide shipping is possible. Um, and to find out more about my work, my website is probably not up to date, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> But I think the easiest and best way is to follow me on Facebook, yes. on my Facebook page. And that is Gabi Neuro Understanding Horses. Yeah. Excellent. This is very news and also when we open enrollment for a course uh, and special offers and everything, all that stuff. Fantastic. I'm sure we'll get plenty of our listeners heading on over and checking you out on Facebook. <laughs> so thank you so much for joining me today on the podcast. I've really enjoyed our chat and I really appreciate the time that you've taken to be on the podcast today. So thank you again. Thanks for listening to the Horsemanship Breakthroughs podcast. Make sure you hit the follow button so you get notified every time a new episode is released. And if you've learned even just one small thing from today's show, I would really appreciate if you could leave a review on Apple Podcasts or screenshot this episode and share it on social media. You can connect with me on Instagram at Amalia underscore horses or my website AmaliaDempsey.com where you can find free resources to help you on your horsemanship journey. That's all for today. Thanks for being here. Remember to train with kindness and ride with excellence and I'll see you in the next episode. 